Hi, I'm James Seamus, and it's an honor to help inaugurate this year's Kit Moore Festival at Columbia University. I have the pleasure of introducing Robert Wise's astonishing film, Odds Against Tomorrow, from 1959, and I hope you don't mind if I do it in a rather roundabout way, by making a number of seemingly haphazard connections and associations, all in the service, I hope, of making visible to you the hugeness of producer and star Harry Belafonte's achievement in the making of the film. I'm going to do this introduction in 10 seemingly disparate fragments, but I hope by the end you'll have a sense of their coherence. So here we go. Number one. I begin with a quotation about a different film in this year's festival lineup, 1947's Crossfire. It's from Adrian Scott, the film's producer, who would eventually be blacklisted as one of the Hollywood Ten. He'd been a member of the Communist Party and refused to cooperate with the House Un-American Activities Committee. Now, Scott wrote a memo to his bosses at RKO Studios about the challenges of adapting Crossfire's underlying literary material, a novel called The Brick Foxhole by Richard Brooks. Writes Scott, and I quote, In the book, the soldier murders a fairy. He could have murdered a Negro, a foreigner, or a Jew. It would have been the same thing, end quote. Of course, it wouldn't have been the same thing, at least if you happen to be the queer, black, Jewish, or foreign person being murdered. More than theoretically, you could have been all four of those people at the same time. No matter, in post-World War II America, each of those persons could only be made visible in the cinema in very specific ways. Just as importantly, though, they each could stand in for, substitute for, front for, figure for each other. They were fungible emblems of repression and censorship, of panic and dread. The black, the Jew, the foreigner, the queer. Two, for many of the first great critics of film noir, among them Raymond Board and Etienne Chamaton and Paul Schrader, the progress or rather descent of the noir hero mirrors that of the genre itself, leading both protagonist and text toward a seemingly inevitable apotheosis and violent death, a kind of generic suicide. Unlike later readings of noir as an unkillable trans-historical affect, Borg and Chamaton, Schrader after them, see the genre as in a deep and necessary way, having a necessarily brief and violent life cycle itself. In 1971, the then critic Paul Schrader wrote the seminal English language essay on film noir. Schrader would, of course, go on to write the screenplay for Scorsese's Taxi Driver and 25 more films as a writer and director, including this past year's neo noir, The Card Counter. Now, for Schrader, noir models for us a kind of existential protest through its commitment to an aesthetic patterning, a commitment to style that is also thus for him a kind of ethical protest against the meaninglessness of the social world in which we find ourselves situated. Noir's fatalistic commitment to the aesthetic forms a horizon against which we can imagine acting with a prospect of meaning unavailable to us in daily life. Three, now this argument of traitors that noir's abject commitment to style, to the aesthetic, to art, art figured here is a literally inanimate counter to an otherwise meaningless and degraded life is for him an ethical stance. And it, this stance oddly informs Schrader's other most influential contribution to the study of noir. His idea of the genre's periodicity, its beginning, middle, and end as a genre. Four. Now, the critical and academic debates over noir's periodization can seem a pedantic and trivial topic at times, I know. But those debates can actually open up some really interesting questions. Schrader, for example, demarcates three rough phases of noir. There's phase one, from around 1941 to 46. It's the classical period of the war years, with high studio gloss, sophisticated private eyes, think Bogart and Bacall. Then comes phase two, 1945 to 1949 or so, the post-war, let's call it the post-war PTSD realist period, where we find crime in the streets, political corruption, and less romantic heroes, guys like Burt Lancaster and Robert Ryan, who we'll see in Eyes Against Tomorrow. And we find also the work of more proletarian directors and settings. And lastly, there's phase three, a period of, and I quote Schrader, psychotic action and suicidal impulse. The noir hero, Schrader argues, and I'm quoting again, seemingly under the weight of 10 years of despair, started to go bananas. For Schrader, this final suicidal phase is, quote, the cream of the film noir period. This evolution, or rather devolution, of noir as a genre is also that of the white male protagonist who embodies and executes its narratives, a central hero committed to generic suicide and its violent passage from life to art. This is why Schrader names the last noir, and its all-time greatest text, according to him, 
as Robert Aldrich's deliriously apocalyptic Kiss Me Deadly from 1955, while adding Orson Welles' Touch of Evil from 1958 as Noir's final decadent epitaph. Five. But then, in 1959, comes Odds Against Tomorrow, a film that the great noir scholar Robert Nicholas argues, Contra Schrader, should be thought of as the last noir. Is this argument just some scholarly nitpicking, or is there more to it? Well, spoiler alert, there may be more to it. Six. Let me return to the issue of figuration and substitution and fronting raised by Adrian Scott. It's an issue that's been raised by many great critics of noir, Matthew Diawara, Eric Lodge, Lloyd Murphy, among others, who note that what Schrader saw as a progressive cracking up of the white male noir hero was, in interesting ways, an increasing noirification of the white hero whose affect and narrative trajectory toward ever greater marginality subjectifies him as, well, noir. This noirification is often realized in dark, urban, mean street environments that tellingly are often denuded of precisely the brown and black bodies who would actually have increasingly crowded them as whites began to flee for the suburbs. Noir thus makes invisible the black that it increasingly subjectively colors its white characters as. White, in a sense, stands in for black, while black itself becomes a metaphor, a marker, for what critic Frank Wilderson will argue as the non-representable non-being of the black subject. Noir makes whites noir while making blacks disappear. Seven. So when Robert Mitlitch argues for Odds Against Tomorrow's classic noir's last film, one reason might be this. Noir's blackness in its classic iteration exists through the repression or erasure, refiguration of any possible black subject, instead figuring blackness as a crisis in the figure of the white protagonist. In this argument, noir and black cannot exist in the same film. Scholar Michael Gillespie makes some very telling critiques of some of the assumptions behind versions of this argument, um, showing us how noir blackness shouldn't be understood simply as fact or substance, but as per Matthew Diawara, something made legible and visible retroactively and discursively. But it's also true that in 1959, when Harry Belafonte, then perhaps the biggest recording artist in the world, decides to produce Odds Against Tomorrow, he intervenes decisively in this series of substitutions, figurations, and repressions. Intervenes, in fact, to apocalyptic, murderous, suicidal effect. And he does so by placing himself as producer, as actor, as star text, and as black man not at the margins of noir, but literally and quite visibly at its dead center. And in doing so, he blows the whole genre, perhaps finally, up. Eight. Here's one substitution. Belafonte hires Abe Polanski to co-write the screenplay, except Polanski's on the blacklist and cannot be acknowledged as the writer. So Belafonte hires John Killens, a black novelist, to, as they put it at the time, front for Polanski. And thus, a double affront by Belafonte to white Hollywood's tender sensibilities. Polanski, by the way, would only be granted screen credit for his work retroactively in 1996. Nine, another substitution. Belafonte hires Robert Wise to direct the film. Now, Wise is today best known for directing huge Academy Award-winning hits, such as the original West Side Story and The Sound of Music. He got his start as an editor at RKO. He edited Citizen Kane. But then, working his way up through Val Luton's B Horror Unit, he made a number of wonderful horror and noir films, among which one of my favorites, The Setup a 1947 boxing noir starring Robert Ryan, who later co-stars against Belafonte as the pathological racist in the film you're about to see, Odds Against Tomorrow. Now, in the setup, Ryan's character is based on the hero of a long narrative poem written by Joseph Moncure March. And as you see from the cover of the book's first edition, that character was, well, not exactly white. The studio would not allow Wise to retain the race of the story's hero, Wise, a dedicated liberal, did write in a remarkable supporting character played by the great James Edwards, a brilliant actor whose own career was cut short when he refused to testify in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee. So Ryan, who was himself a tremendously principled man of the left in real life, literally fronts a black man and a dozen years later plays a white racist in a film written by a Jew, fronted by a black man. Ten, all of which is to say Harry Belafonte, making odds against tomorrow, damn well knew that the murder of a queer, a foreigner, a black, or a Jew 
were certainly not the same thing. He fronted the fronts, substituted the substitutions, and made apocalyptically visible the murderous logics that underwrote Noir's classical generic identity. So please press play and enjoy Harbell, Harry Belafonte, Productions, Odds Against Tomorrow.